Uh, but let's get to the main event here tonight. Speaker Sean Ellis. So as you guys know, he's a growth expert. I think he coined the term growth hacker back in the day. He's founder and CEO of growthhackers.com. Before that, he was founder and CEO of Qualaroo. He's helped a lot of teams, including Dropbox, Eventbrite, and Zomni, um, grow their products. Um, he's an author. His, his previous book was Startup Growth Engines, and his new book that just came out is Hacking Growth. His Twitter sign is at Sean Ellis, and he's going to talk to us today, share advice on how to set and achieve high-impact growth goals. So let's give Sean a warm welcome, please. Thanks. So as Dan mentioned, I'm Sean Ellis. Uh, I'm going to be talking about setting and achieving uh, high-impact objectives and how that's really important for driving sustainable growth in your business. Um, before we get started with that, I'll start with something unrelated, give you a chance to all settle in a little bit. Um, there's another place where I've used objectives to do something nearly impossible, which was with weight. Um, so if anyone's ever struggled with weight loss, you know how hard that can be. When I uh, entered my 30s, I, was, uh, I felt myself putting on a few pounds and tried to fight it really hard to, uh, to, to not put on additional pounds tried to eat better, tried to exercise, it didn't really work, and then I had a, a scary enough health issue that it kind of woke me up to where I said, okay, I gotta focus on this, and I set a really aggressive objective, like five pounds per week, and I said, I gotta, I gotta lose five pounds per week, and I gotta you know, work backwards from there, what's the right amount of exercise, what are the right calories, and started to just work on that weight loss goal. If I didn't hit the goal, in the week, then I moved to two times a day exercising, like really hard. So when, you come, when it comes time to uh, snacking, suddenly you feel like, uh, gosh, I don't have the energy to eat that snack. So um, I actually ended up losing uh, 30 pounds in six weeks and kept it off for a long time. I put some of it back on, but never got back to that level that I was uh, 15 years ago. And so um, that Really hard goal, breaking it down, setting goals is, is really similar to what you do when you're growing a company. Of course, I was trying to shrink with companies trying to grow them. So um, we're going to start with talking about the um, impact of having the right goals and how that really affects sustainable growth. Then we'll go into finding high leverage opportunities in your business and how you can tap into those opportunities to accelerate growth further, and then how you can use a proven process for actually hitting the goals. So um, let's start with what happens if you don't have goals set. Um, what I've, I've seen it lots of times in companies, I've seen it in my own company, uh, the team quickly gets out of sync if you're not clear about what the goals are. And then, and then effort's wasted. I had uh, on my own team, I had somebody recently say, uh, hey, you know that banner that we were working on? I finally got a designer to, to do that banner. And, it's like, we, we don't need the banner anymore. We're, we like moved on. That was, that was for something that we don't need it anymore. And so the designers whose time was really hard to get suddenly was wasted on something that didn't matter. He got demoralized. So um, gross stalls, effort gets wasted. It's just, it's a frustrating process. Um, and I, I went through that at Log Me In. So uh, gosh, probably 15 years ago now at Log Me In, we hit a, a big gross stall early in the business where we we're f trying to grow and I was kind of doing the normal approach that marketers do where um, you know you focus on the channels and you focus on a low uh, cost of generating a sign up and then try to drive that person in to, to, to ultimately give you a return on investment but what we were finding is that uh, people were not were not actually using the product so we were driving sign ups at thousands of users a day I had VCs who were patting us on the back saying, that's awesome, you're doing great, but if they're not using the product, we weren't gonna be able to get a return on investment. It was not uh, effective in the business. So we got together as a team, I presented the data to my CEO and I was like, we're not gonna be able to grow this business unless we figure out how to get somebody from signing up all the way to using the product, to purchasing the product. We gotta work across across the functions within the organization beyond what we can just do on the marketing team. And so we, focused on the objective of really getting activation right. And over the next uh, kind of two months, three months, um, we were able to get about a 10x improvement in the percentage of people who 
signed up for the product and actually used the product. And so what that did from a marketing perspective, the same channels that previously scaled to about $10,000 a month now, no new creativity. So it's all like, why can't you figure this out as a marketer? But no new creativity, just went back and tried the same stuff that we had done previously, and suddenly now that we could spend over a million dollars a month with a three month payback on, invest on investment. So um, focusing on the right objective in the business and, and rallying the team around that, got it to where we could actually grow the business much more effectively. And uh, today it's a $6 billion valued company. And I think if we hadn't really address that growth stall in a way that we set the right objectives and got everybody rallied around those objectives, I think we would have had a really hard time uh, even, even still being in business today. And so the impact of the right objectives is huge on a business. Um, saw it at Dropbox as well. Um, Dropbox actually just published a couple of months ago their uh, growth trajectory. And um, we, you know, it's a uh, the fastest company to get to a $1 billion revenue run rate. And you can see, I, I was there for the first six months of public availability, and you can see that trajectory was started very early. And again, especially early in a company, being able to set the right objectives, focus on the right things, goes a long way to being able to drive sustainable growth over, over the long haul. So a big part of driving sustainable growth is, again, kind of what I looked at when I was at Log Me In. I was getting praise for driving signups, but signups don't create any value in the business. Signups that don't use the product actually create negative value. Those people, those people wasted their time. They never actually got value from the product. And so you do that long enough, you have frustrated people and it can really hurt you. So the first thing that you really want to do is understand what is value for the customer in the business. And so the concept of North Star metric is one that uh, leading growth teams use quite a bit. Are, who's familiar with this idea of a North Star met metric? Okay, so good, Most, probably, probably about half the people, but the idea with it is instead of focusing on a metric like signups, which may or may not have value, you focus on what is the experience that someone has with the product where they really get value from the product. And you try to quantify that experience in a way that that's what you're aiming at. When you, when you think about growth, you think about expansion of value. When you expand value, you retain those people. You don't retain someone who doesn't have a valuable experience. But when you can quantify that valuable experience with a metric, you suddenly can start to really optimize efforts across the company, dollars, and everything else to expand value. As value expands, Growth is retained, retained growth is real growth. And so North Star metric is a really important concept when you think about setting objectives. All of your objectives should be about enhancing this North Star metric. So uh, a couple of examples to, to bring it to life a little bit because it can be a bit of a confusing concept. Um, Airbnb, uh, their North Star metric is nights booked. So when someone books a night at Airbnb, on, on an Airbnb property, there's value for the host, there's value for the guest, and the more times that happens, the more value is being created in the system. And so just adding a lot more potential guests who never stay somewhere didn't, didn't create value in the system. So being able to really say, okay, this is the value creating activity and optimizing spend and efforts on that is gonna lead to a lot more sustainable growth. For, for Facebook, it's daily active users. Again, a, a sign up on Facebook that never use the product is not valuable at all. LinkedIn, it might be valuable because other people can at least see that page and maybe reach out and end up hiring that person. But in Facebook, if they never connect with anybody, no one's gonna see that page on Facebook. I mean, they, they, might, they might see that the person was one day on there, but it's, the likelihood of value being created is really low. But as more people get added to Facebook, there's more value for everyone on the network. And one of the people who was a key executive on the growth team, uh, probably about six months ago, I saw him presenting somewhere and he said he thought that that was the number one thing that Mark Zuckerberg did at Facebook was define a common success metric that rallied everyone in the company around building that success metric. That, that helped to help to actually provide sustainable growth in the business when people could quantify their efforts in a way that was actually building real value in the business. So this North Star metric is really important as you think about growing your business. And then the North Star metric can actually be broken into a number of levers. Every business can be a little bit different, but these 
generally apply to most businesses. So the first is acquisition. So that's traditionally where marketing is focused on just bringing new people in the door, maybe driving signups, but if, if those signups never use the product again, there's no value that's created. So that's where the next step is, is activation. When signups actually try the product and get value from the product, they're activated. They've, they've actually experienced it in a way that's much more valuable than simply just driving a sign up. And so a lot of times we refer in the growth world to kind of an aha moment. It's the point where they, where they actually got their first taste of the core value in the product that's gonna keep them coming back over time. And so that's retention is what drives them to come back over time. And one of the most important levers for driving retention is a great first user experience that gets them to that point of activation, that point of aha in the product. And Referral as well is something that, I interestingly, every fast-growing company that I've been a part of, from Eventbrite to Dropbox to Log Me In, look out a uh, number of companies that have gone on to be really valuable companies, referral by far is the biggest driver of growth in those businesses. So in the case of, of Log Me In, as I mentioned, we were spending million dollars plus a month driving growth in the business, but 80% of the people were still coming in through just pure natural unincentivized word of mouth. And so referral is a function of a great experience with the product. So again, that points back to activation. So activation is often a, a really high leverage opportunity for growth. And then revenue as well. If you figure out a way to drive double the uh, revenue per person, you can spend more bringing them in the door in the first place. So suddenly a number of channels open up. So again, like in the case of, of Log Me In, when we 10x the activation rate, we 10x the amount of money we could spend bringing someone to the website in the first place. Um, so that was, that was activation affecting how much we could spend, but the same thing, if you, if you double how much revenue you're bringing in from people, you can spend more to bring them in the door. But basically each of these are variables that go into moving that North Star metric. And so you can focus on any one of those to enhance your North Star metric. The challenge is that most of these levers fall within different departments of the company. So a few people raised their hands saying that they are in a thousand plus people companies, but even the hundred people companies or 200 people companies, it's actually really hard to get everybody on the same page to work together on, on common objectives. So that North Star metric can go a long way as this common metric that everybody is working together to move, uh, but still, in a siloed organization, you have, you have different people with different goals and objectives. And so there is, there is some challenge when these levers sit in different uh, parts of the organization. So even if you don't have like a cross-functional growth team, growth is still a function of what you do in each of these areas of the business. Even if people aren't managing their efforts that way, it's still a function. Growth is not just what marketing does. Growth is what the first year's experience, the ongoing product experience, revenue, all of these things. So ideally what you wanna do is figure out where is the best opportunity across each of these opportunities and figure out how to, how to get the company to focus on those opportunities. And when they're focusing, what they're doing is actually testing in those areas. So the, the realization that whatever you're doing in any one area, there's probably a better way to do that. And that's, that's the kind of the idea behind A-B testing is that just, if you test 10 things, one's gonna be better than the other nine. And so it's, it's about constantly finding that next best, the, that better thing from where you are. But there's a different kind of test that we refer to as, as just pings. So you might not have ever tested, say, Pinterest as a channel. And you get feedback from a lot of your users that they're spending time on Pinterest. So maybe you wanna try something in Pinterest and let's say it works a little bit, then from there you can start to optimize it into maybe being a profitable channel for you. But you can even have uh, a ping that is a new, a new type of landing page with a, with a different kind of entry point into your product. That might be a, a, a new ping as opposed to making changes to an existing page. But uh, Brian Balfour has a really good analogy there uh, that he uses, uh, Brian Balfour uh, uh, has, a, has a company called Reforge now, but used to run growth at HubSpot, and this, this analogy of the game of Battleship, that every time you run a new test, it's like dropping, dropping a uh, pin in Battleship, where 
if it's not even a hit, you still got a bit of a, a bit of an insight into is there an opportunity there or not. If you if there's a lot of misses, then you want to focus maybe in some other areas. But if you see that something works, then driving more experiments in that area, doubling down, are some of usually the best experiments. So. Um, what you don't know is what's going to work and what's not going to work. There's, there's a lot of unpredictability there, so that's where uh, you want to actually focus on velocity of testing and because the quality is hard to predict. Of course you want to try to do the best quality tests that you can run, but the velocity of tests are probably going to be more important over time. And so this is an example of that. Uh, the the um, chart here on the left for you is uh, is... Twitter, they had, um, in, you know, we, we know they've kind of struggled with growth recently, but uh, in 2010, they had almost a completely flat quarter as well, and a new VP of product came in and said, geez, we're running like two tests a month, and we've got all this volume coming through, and how can we be only running two tests per month? And so he upped it to, I think it was 10 tests per week, and uh, was able to as, as soon as he upped it, you can see that growth trajectory took off. That to basically, the more tests you run, the more you learn about better ways to grow the business. So when I read that, I tried it actually in my company, or actually I didn't read it, I, I saw he did a presentation at a, at a meetup and uh, looked at that and thought, gosh, we're not running that many tests in my company. So I, I made a, a quantified objective of three tests per week and we had three flat months going into that, and then as soon as we changed it to three tests per week, we turned the corner where uh, we, we got about a 55% uh, growth in the next six weeks in unique users on growthhackers.com after three flat months. So um, just, the, just being able to have, you can't control the quality of the test, but you can control how many tests you, you can't control if the test is gonna work or not, but you can control how many tests you run. Um, Obviously, if you're running them across these different uh, areas of the business in different silos, that's where the idea of a growth team comes in, that um, you, you have really, I think Facebook's probably one of the, the pioneers behind it. At the same year that Facebook started their growth team, uh, you have LinkedIn that started their growth team. But this idea that uh, you have a, a team that's cross-functional that is really trying to manage growth across these different opportunities within the company, and it's often an autonomous team. So they've got designers, product people, developers, and it, and it overcomes some of the challenges that I found when I was coming from the marketing silo, trying to run tests deeper in product, not a chance. So sometimes you have a, a core product team that can go broad, but almost never can you go from the marketing down. Just marketers really aren't, aren't trusted kind of in core product in most companies. So the goal then is for this team to maximize the, the number of tests that they're running and goals can be a big part of maximizing the impact of those tests. So there's kind of four key things that you wanna look at there. First is you wanna pick the right goal. So we'll go through how you do that. Then you wanna communicate the specifics of that goal across the team so that, so that everybody knows what the, what the goal actually is. That goes a long way in focusing the team on that goal and also helping to understand that we need to put resources behind that. So sometimes senior management then is making resources available there even if those resources may not be all that interested in being available with their people or, or at least freeing up dollars to go into it. And then finally there's a proven process for achieving goals. So let's, let's look at how do, you, how do you actually pick the right goal. Um, so what you're doing is we talked about uh, the levers of growth. So uh, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and revenue. And what you're trying to do is figure out within those levers of growth, what is that, what is that best opportunity for where you are right now? So like in the case of Log Me In, as I talked about earlier, it was really clear. If I've got over 90% of my users who sign up for the product and they never actually use it, I have to address that. That's like a, a glaring issue in, in the business. And if I address that, it's gonna make it easier to spend money. They're gonna be retained longer. So activation is, is often a good place to start. So this is actually based on, we did a uh, growth study on LinkedIn uh, a while ago with growth hackers where 
we took all of the information out there about how LinkedIn's grown, every like, quotes from all the, the executives, just broke down the product ourselves, and tried to just map these things out. So being able to look at the growth levers in a diagram form, more of a, a, a flow of how users move through, starts to help you understand really what's going on. So the more that you can document conversion rates, the more that you can layer in qualitative information about what drives conversions, what prevents conversions, uh, you can start to hone in on what those opportunities are. And when you actually see a problem, it becomes a lot easier to generate ideas of tests that can fix that problem. And that ultimately, all of this should be looked at in terms of what, it, what is going to help you make progress against your North Star metric. So once you identify a specific area, that's where you want to boil it down to a very specific goal. So um, what, is the, what is the baseline metric that you're working? What is the target metric? What is the timeline for reaching that metric? And if you want to generate ideas from the team around that, the more context you can give the team around the issue, the more likely you're going to get relevant ideas that, that are actually going to fix that issue. So um, as much context as you can, can communicate as possible is really important. And that will help to focus resources on achieving the objective. So uh, another thing that I like to do is actually put an objective owner on the objective. So instead of, instead of saying it's everybody's job, Find somebody who's passionate about achieving that objective, and, and they're the, really the champion for achieving that objective. And clearly, if, if they have three other objectives they're trying to achieve, it's, it's less likely that they'll be effective. So I, I recommend that you limit it to one objective per person. And, uh, and, and if you've got like a team of 10 people, say, on a growth team, I don't think you should be carrying 10 objectives. Like, Ideally, it's, it's going to be like two or three objectives. As if, if you have 100 people on a growth team or 200 people, then you might be able to take on a lot more objectives and have people focus around different parts of the product experience. But having that, that one owner on there who's really committed to hitting it uh, helps a lot. Um, th this last point of just not having direct financial incentive around it, um, anyone who's who's uh, kind of dug into how, how financial incentives work on things, a lot of times they can get in the way of, uh, of creativity and actually solving something. So I, I like long-term uh, long financial incentives around hitting like annual goals, but for a, for a shorter term goal, um, I, I actually think what, what you'll have is somebody will start to sandbag it a little bit more. So having a uh, uh, not direct financial in, incentive is probably better. So, interesting, I had, I had this issue on my team at, uh, at Growth Hackers, and I have a VP of engineering at the time who, um, he's now broadened his, his uh, responsibility, but he, had, he really hadn't generated any ideas around our growth. He, he wasn't really engaged in the process very much, but what we do in our company, we're small enough that we actually, in our uh, weekly executive meetings, talk about what are the right uh, core objectives in the business. And you know, every, every few weeks, we might add a new one or change something up. And so I had looked at an activation objective that, um, I, you know, based on what I'd seen at Log Me In, where I saw a 10x improvement, um, I, I knew that, that based on what we were at that time in, our, in a SaaS product that we'd released, that we really had a lot of room for improvement. And so I put out a goal of, uh, of tripling our activation rate in 30 days. And my VP of engineering said, you're crazy. That's, that's impossible. And um, which, at least he was engaged. He's thinking about it. So I was like, all right, what is he going to say? Like, we should only do a 10% <laughs> improvement. And uh, so I said, so what do you think is more reasonable? And, and that's where he came back and said, 45 days. <laughs> Okay, so if, we, if it takes 45 days instead of 30 days, that's fine. So it was, I was expecting something a lot more uh, sandbaggy from him. But I think just the thought process that he went through in trying to figure out if the objective was realistic, he that same day then went back and prototyped something that he thought would actually solve the issue and came back like a few hours later when I got back from lunch. He's like, I actually have an idea that I think might solve this activation issue. I, I put a little prototype together, what do you think about this? And took me through it and it was great. And you know, he had the ability to actually code something up much more quickly than 
other people on the team would, and uh, we were able to hit the objective in a, in a much shorter period of time based on the prototype they showed me that, that day. So I think just, just setting that objective and allowing discussion around if, if it's reasonable or realistic uh, led to his engagement to where he actually came up with a solution to it. So I think, uh, I think that, that that can be, just the objective itself can do, do a lot in getting people aligned around it. And so the process for actually achieving goals, once you've, once you've defined the goal, the timeline for the goal, um, looks like this. It looks really, it's the scientific process. It's not kind of rocket science, but it's about analyzing the situation, being able to f generate as many ideas around that with hypotheses w for those ideas, and then prioritizing which of those ideas you're going to test, which ones you think have the, the best kind of balance of, of effort and, and potential against that objective, and, and then running the tests, and then analyzing and just kind of repeating that over time. So let's look at each of these individually. So on the analyzing the situation, uh, the, the Quality, quantitative analysis is, is pretty clear. If you're, if you're losing 90% of the people at a step in the funnel, for example, then there's probably an opportunity for improvement. If you have you know, close to perfect conversion rate from one step to the next, then just on a quantitative level, you know that there's probably not a lot of room for improvement. But then qualitatively, if you can understand what's going on there, sometimes if, if you can identify a real problem through qualitative research using something like user testing, one of our sponsors, uh, or user voice, user anything, <laughs> um, you, you can start to kind of hone in on what the, what the opportunity uh, might be and, and if you have some ideas on what, what's actually broken. So fixing usability issues is often something that comes through qualitative feedback and can, can tell you that there's a really good opportunity there. And then you, you combine those things for insights. So I talked about at Log Me In where we got that 10x improvement in activation. Uh, one of the areas where we focused on improving, uh, with just one step in the, in the activation area, was uh, one new channel that we turned on that was sending 200,000 new people a day to, to log me in for, for ac pretty cheap, actually. And, uh, and we had a 10% sign up rate, so 20,000 people a day signing up through this channel, and again, most of them not using the product. And so, the first thing that we did was we just started kind of randomly testing stuff and you know put, oh, they must not see the download button. Let's, let's put a big download button there. And that, that didn't work. And let's, let's make sure that they know it's free. We'll put a big free. That didn't work. You know, the, the famous button color tests. We did some, some button color tests, whatever it was. You know, may, maybe let's put a little security message. That, that might be the issue. But fortunately, they were registering, so we had their email address, and then they weren't using, or they weren't downloading, so we could just ask them. So we finally sent out a, a note to them and said, why did you sign up for this thing and never download it? And we got the feedback that they didn't believe it was free. Okay, now we have a problem we can solve against, and our next test, we got a tripling of the conversion rate to download, and that was simply giving them a choice download the free version, which we put a big graphical check mark, and then, or download the paid version, a trial of the paid version. But once they saw that there was a trial of the paid version, the credibility of the free offer was, was much stronger, and so we, we were able to free them up to, to go through uh, the funnel. And what was interesting, the reason this was an issue for these people versus most of the rest of the people coming in and signing up were coming through search. So they were seeing go to my PC ads on TV, they knew they wanted this type of a solution. They were a lot of times searching for free alternatives to or, or at least free access. And then they, then they would see an ad that said, get it for free. So they were kind of in market already. They were much more likely to want to test the solution. But this channel, it was a total impulse user. So they, it was kind of an untargeted, uh, it was actually through Google as well, but it was a, it was a, like a Google content ad targeted to the keyword FTP. And so we were getting two cent clicks on it. And these people didn't know they needed a solution like this, but it, like, wow, I can access my computer for free. That sounds pretty good. I can, I can get the files so somewhat related to maybe what they were on, but it was still a pretty impulsive click. And at that step, they were dropping off. So, so we just needed to treat them differently. And so um, that 300% improvement made that a viable channel. Otherwise, we would have had to turn it off. What's that? 
How did we do which? So that, that's where we gave them the choice of download the free version or download a trial of the paid version. So it was just a test that we ran where instead of just click to download, we gave them a choice between the two. And that, that before it was, so the, the original test was click to download. The next test was choose free version or trial of paid version. The, and that, that gave it a 300%. A, a I don't know exactly why, but y it was a response to the problem we identified through the qualitative research. So it wasn't a total guess. It was actually, we were, we were solving against a known problem, which I think helps you to, to be inspired with, with solutions that are more likely to work. So that's really, um, idea generation is, sorry, go ahead. No, we definitely had a hypothesis for that test. We, we said, we don't, they don't believe that this is really free. We learned that through the qualitative research. So by showing them that we have a business model, we believe that they will actually download the product. So that our hypothesis was, they, what was holding them back was they don't, they, they think it's a scam. Why would you be giving away this technology for free? But when they see we have a paid version, suddenly it's more credible. So, um, Basically, yeah, creative problem solving. When you can actually identify the problem, it's, you know, it's one of those things where, if, you know, kind of famous with the uh, growth hacking, people all the time come up to me and say, give me a growth hack. <laughs> I, I don't know what's going to work to grow your business, but when you can know what the problem is that's preventing someone from converting or the opportunity in a channel where you haven't tried something, you're just much more likely to come up with a relevant test that, is more likely to work, but you still need to run the test. You can't just accept it at face value. And so the more that you can identify and contextualize the problem, the more likely you're going to generate uh, useful ideas from the team. So, right. Yeah, so he's asking the cycle time to run a test. Um, it really depends on the test. It's, it's whatever is a, a, a statistically significant sample size. Yeah, so that you want to run like kind of big aggressive tests, especially if you've got a, a, a low traffic flow. So I don't think we would ever run a test for more than a month, for example. Like we're, we're trying to run tests that we can see the answer in a week or two. But um, there's, there's some good, good testing best practices on the uh, Conversion XL blog, if you're familiar with that, that blog. Um, but, uh, but basically, like, yeah, the more that you know about what the problem is, the more likely in a brainstorming session you're going to generate actual ideas related to that problem. A lot of times the ideas come not in a brainstorming session, but when you're out for a walk or whatever it is, but you just want to capture as many ideas as you can. The more ideas that you have, the more you have to choose from. And so it becomes really important then to actually score those ideas and have, it, have a good way of being able to compare them. So we use a scoring system that we call ICE, which is looking at the idea on impact. So if this works, is it going to be a, a high impact potential idea? Or is it something that, you know, if, if we figure out the doubling of the conversion rate on a landing page that only 1% of the traffic goes through, it's really hard to get much impact out of that page, for example. So being able to just say, in best possible scenario, is this likely to have a lot of impact for us? And how confident are we that it's going to work? Like I said, when we were just randomly running tests at that step in the funnel that logged me in, they weren't working very well. But once we knew the problem, if you had asked me how confident I am, after we ran 15 tests that didn't move the needle, the next test, I would have said, oh, I'm about 5% chance that this thing will be successful. But once we knew the problem, like I actually may give it a 50-50 that this might work. So, so on a confidence level, that would have been a lot higher. And then finally, how easy is it to test? Is it something that's going to take three weeks of development just to run the test? Or is it something that, you know, with, with Optimizely that you can, you can just spin up a different version and it's going to take a few minutes? So I, I, we have one test at Growth Hackers that the impact we guessed as only a four, but, when, but because it was so easy, we ran it anyway, because it was, it was literally moving an email collector from a bottom of a page to a top of a page. But that movement, that, that change gave us a 700% increase in emails collected. And so it was, we were way off on the impact, and we didn't mind. That was good. Um, but
But it, because it was so easy, we ran the test. And again, if you go back to that idea of more tests lead to more learning, you're, just, you're more likely to stumble into something that works really well if you're running the test. You kind of don't learn anything if you're just thinking about tests you could run, but you're just discounting them and like, oh, probably won't work, let's not even run it. So you just don't know what's going to work and what's not going to. But a scoring system like this gives you the ability to at least compare ideas a little bit better. So again, each one on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, the best ideas are going to be, gosh, so this work is going to work really well. So um, high impact, we'd give it a 10. Really confident, there's a lot of research and data, user tests, survey data, quantitative drop-off, like, yeah, this, this is a, a, a 10 confidence, and it's really easy to do the test. That's, that's the one you should run first versus something that is more of a guess that's really hard to implement. Go ahead. Sorry? We, we actually just average them, but, um, like, I don't think that, that it needs... Yeah, it, there's, it's not, like, majorly scientific. So, so some weeks... If we're finding that we're targeting three tests per week and we're only getting one out, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put more weight on the ease than on the impact or confidence because I, I want to hit my tempo goal. But if we're hitting the tempo goal and we're not seeing very many wins, then maybe I'm going to focus on, on, on confidence. Or if we're seeing a lot of wins but none of them really move the needle much, then I'm going to focus on impact. So you can kind of change your weighting based on, based on the business. So, and then... You can get ideas really from anywhere as you're running different, different tests. So just on a single Dropbox screen, for example, you can see each of these started as a ping test at some point. When, when we first had, I, when I was there, you had the, if you clicked on the icon, the, your recently saved files would, would show up. And after I left, somebody had the idea of, if you mouse over that file, let's add a share link. And that share link then gave you a shortcut to the, to the, uh, to the URL that makes it really easy to share that file. And every time someone grabs the file, they're seeing a little promo for Dropbox. So that, that really opened up that channel. Then someone else thought, this is a good merchandising space. People spend a lot of time on this screen. And then, again, each one of these can be optimized. And the, the step that it links to can be optimized. So there, there's just so many different tests that, that could come off of just looking at a single screen on Dropbox. And your product's going to be the same way if you just start to start to kind of keep your eye open for those opportunities and, and especially like other things that, that maybe your competitors are doing or that even, you know, businesses that might be a lot different, but you look and you're like, oh, that, that, that seems like something we should try. Then, then you try to tailor it more to your business. Um, so once you've scored these ideas and you have this I score, this is where it becomes much easier to actually compare ideas. So you can do it in a spreadsheet, but just somehow being able to, to sort, okay, if we're going to look by, by impact, what are the high impact ideas that are in backlog that relate to the objective we're trying to achieve? Those, those are the ideas we should probably test first, or again, kind of depending on what, if you want to just do an equal weighting. What we do on my team is that we actually, each person kind of, kind of looks at the backlog of ideas related to the objective and figures out two that they are enthusiastic about. And then they do a little 30 second pitch to the team. Just, this is why I want to run this test. And then, you know, and, and what you'll see a lot of times is that a bunch of other people on the team also are pitching that idea. And then we narrow down from maybe five or 10 ideas that are pitched by the team and narrow down to the, to the three that we want to run that week. And, uh, and that's what we do in the growth meeting. So, um, and again, it's like if, if resources are really tight, then we're going to focus on, on really easy ideas. Um, but we, if we've got the resources and we need some big wins, then maybe we're going to more, lean more toward the uh, confidence and, uh, and impact. And then you're really testing. So if it's against an objective, that's the f initial analysis that you want to do on the idea. Because what I found in, in a lot of businesses is that if you, if you kind of just look at what are all the things that could have happened as a result of that test, you could, you could be analyzing a single test for weeks. And so what I like to do is at least triage the analysis to first say, did the hypothesis you know, what happened versus the hypothesis? Did, did it achieve the objective? Did it have impact on the objective? You already know that the objective is important to your North Star metric. And 
after you've analyzed every test, then maybe you go back and you look for unexpected things or, or negative things, but it's, if you don't have the learning, then you're not gonna be able to generate the next set of ideas. As I mentioned, the double down ideas are often the best ideas, and you can't double down if it's kind of still in analysis for a few weeks. Do so you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so one, you don't need to run it, obviously, just because if you're looking at like 30-day retention, you don't need to run it for 30 days to see that. So you can turn it off after seven days, make an early read on your seven-day retention, and then, and then make sure, like, I mean, it, it just takes discipline to make sure that the team is looking at it at the 30-day retention mark. So whether that's just putting a calendar notification or something that just says we've got to check back in on this, but... Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, so we actually have every, as I, I mentioned, that every objective has an owner. We also have every test that has an owner. And what I look at on the test is that the owner needs to, be, needs to actually believe the test is going to work. If they don't believe the test is going to work, then they're basically the project manager to get the test out, and they're going to go way too minimum on the minimum viable test because they're just, they're just checking it off, getting it off their list. But there's a really good healthy tension if they, if they believe it's going to work and then they're getting pushback on the resources to implement it where the resources are saying, let's implement it this way. And they say, I don't think it's going to work if we do it that way. And, and trying to find what is that minimum viable test that they still believe is going to work. And so that, that same owner should be the one who's, who's saying, okay, I need to notify myself to check back in on this after 30 days. So, on my team, for example, uh, our analyst has generated more test ideas than anyone else on the team. So the whole myth of there's the creative types and the analytical types, he's actually generated more ideas and has a higher winning rate than anyone else, and it's because he's, he's like immersed in the data. And so uh, he doesn't have exclusive access to the data. Everyone else could be immersed in the data if they want to, but uh, it's, it's really the responsibility of us as a growth team to get the rest of the company uh, spending as much time in the data and understanding what's working and why it's working and what tests we're running and which tests aren't working and th there's, there's learning in every test and so um, being able to share that becomes really important and it, it keeps the goal top of mind for people so even, even if that particular test doesn't lead to, lead to some kind of epiphany of an idea just saying we're trying to achieve this goal, this test failed. Sometimes somebody, I have a totally different idea, but I think this one will succeed. It just kind of keeps it top of mind for people. And, but it, there is that reinforcing loop as, as, uh, as you run the tests and you get winners and losers. Both of them lead to generally more test ideas. You have a question? Uh, sorry. Uh, did you guys internally test that to see whether or not like doing some type of, of data sharing perspective of the individual who has a lot more ideas, uh, you know, some way in which he shares that, how he's analyzing data or learning from the data so that, you know, the rest of the team kind of picks up on that and is able to maybe generate more ideas that are successful. We should. No, it's a, it's a <laughs> so, um, hopefully because the microphone, the, the question is there, but the, uh, yeah, this, this, I, I am jumping to the conclusion that because he's immersed in the data, but I think part of it is that he, he had a lower winning rate initially, and the more over time it's in, improved. So being able to just see that improvement, I'm, I'm think it's more likely that it that it he that's that's leading to his higher win rate. But you're right. I mean, in an ideal world, we'd we'd not show one group of people and show another group of people. And I I have uh, I have a friend who runs growth at a company, or he left not that long ago, but at a company called Freelancer, and. Um, he, those are the types of tests that he does all the time, like basically putting up dashboards for these people and no dashboards for these people and seeing just like all kinds of tests to just see who, who has a better win rate based on you know, exposure to data. And even like if I, if I pair someone in their first few weeks with someone who's really good at this versus if I don't pair them, does... What's, what's the success rate? So it, it's smart to, to think about how can you actually take A-B testing to like a whole nother level. But I think um, my team's still pretty small, so I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, you got to kind of draw the line somewhere. Um, 
So some of the key takeaways, and then we can open it up to some more questions. So uh, key takeaways. First, North Star metric is really important. If you only take away one thing today, I would, I would say really spend some time understanding what value people get from your product and figure out a way to quantify that with a single metric and measure progress in that metric. You know, and, it, and it's cumulative. So um, like the, the question of, uh, of, okay, I want to drive long-term retention. Like if, if you're only focused on retention, then what you might say is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring new people in who have lower than the average retention because they're dragging my average retention down. But if, you're, if your North Star metric is essentially the cumulative value you're, you're delivering across the user base, even if these people come in with half the value, they're still expanding your North Star metric. So you, it, it starts to normalize my team's goal versus this team's goal. Like everybody should, like it, it settles arguments uh, w when you basically say, please stop bringing in low quality leads if, if the dollar spent on that lead generates $2 back and those people are, are expanding your North Star metric, then, then that's an effort that's, that's worth doing. And just because another group has a lower kind of mid-funnel conversion rate, that's not a reason to, to stop bringing those people in. So the North Star metric can really kind of keep everybody on the same page there. Once you understand the North Star metric, you want to understand what are the variables that lead to growth in that North Star metric? How, what, what are each of the things that you could potentially be testing around? What's the relationship between those variables? And, uh, and then you want to look for what are, what are some high leverage opportunities? Where is it most broken where you can focus some of your energy and resources? The, at that point, you want to communicate those goals widely across the organization, try to you just never, like most people don't have maybe the support team who's generating, uh, generating ideas and insights, but the support team's going to have some awesome onboarding ideas because they're talking to people all the time and seeing what people are getting caught up in. So um, the, the broader you communicate goals, the, the more likely that uh, the relevant people are going to come up with, with breakthrough ideas. And then just follow, you, you can't have too many ideas if you have a really good process for being able to decide which of those ideas you're going to test. So at that point, you want to build as much of the backlog as you can. And then you say, OK, these ideas relate to this core objective. And then all of those ideas that relate to this core objective, now I have the ICE score to start to compare which of those ideas are the ones that we should be focusing on first. And uh, most people say, lots of ideas is not, is not a problem for my company. Like we have lots of ideas, we have a hard time executing them. But once you once you actually have the resources to execute them, and what I find is that the more wins that you get through that execution, the more people buy into the process, and then and then suddenly the ideas start to dry up, and you you need more ideas. So um, like all of these things, whatever the problem is that you have in your company, like just be kind of internalize all of these things because a lot of times fixing that problem is going to lead to a new one. And so maybe ideas aren't the problem for you yet, but if you find a great way to execute lots of them and you set a high tempo goal, then you're likely to suddenly start to need to generate more ideas. So there's a question in the back there. All right, let's use the mic. Just raise just your hand if you have a question. We've got two mics running here. Yeah, cool. Just raise your right. hand and we'll get you a mic. How do you manage the relationship between these goals that are being set, new goals, and pressure? But, but I'll explain that a bit differently, right? Pressure from a positive and a negative point of view. So you set goals and you want, Facebook wants X signups, X daily users, and the growth team goes and they knock it out the park or they miss it by a lot. But is, do, do you think it's positive to create this pressure or is it simply these are our goals and will you tell me how you do it? So if you set the, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding correctly. I'm not sure that microphone's actually on. I couldn't hear very well. Um, but the, uh, but basically, like when a goal is missed, is it because because the the it's a wrong goal or the owner's not working it very well? Is that is that what you're asking? Well, if you if you have a goal, right, and you task a team with that goal, and you want ten thousand, whatever the goal is, and they reach six thousand, is that just a point of what went wrong? How do we do it? Or is there pressure that is created on that? Why did you not reach that goal? Yeah, on my team, we're we're really collaborative around it, and 
what I've found is um, I, I had one guy on my team who was, who, was, who was managing a goal around channel partners. And what's good is when you, when you, start, when you actually identify the goal, the, the early indication that you're not going to hit the goal is when no one has any ideas of tests to run against that goal. Like, that's the first indication. It's almost impossible you're going to hit the goal if there's zero inspiration in how to hit the goal. And so by keeping track of that, I was able to, to, to basically, I got two or three weeks into it, and that goal owner kept generating ideas and nominating ideas for other people's goals. And so I, you know, I could get upset and say, come on, man, focus on your goal. But I instead said, hey, what's going on? I, um, you seemed enthusiastic about this goal when we set it up. Has something changed? And that's where he was able to present some new data that suggested that that's probably not what we should be focusing on. The two or three channel partners that we had gotten excited about had kind of dried up and we, we were down to a point where we really weren't seeing signal there. And so it gave me the opportunity to re-engage and say, I mean, again, doubling down is a lot of what this is about. You want to, you want to like work a vein while it's, while it's good. And so if I set a goal and say I want to get something to, you know, from, from 30 to 100 or, you know, whatever, whatever you know, or, or a 15% conversion to a 30% conversion and I nail it really fast, do you move on to another goal or do you say, gosh, how much room for improvement is there? Should I, should I keep working that? If, if it was that easy to get to 30%, maybe I should be aiming for 45%. And so that's, that's how we would do it on my team is if we really struggle to get there, then the cost of achieving that goal kind of kind of outweighs the benefit of going for that goal and that there's probably some lower hanging fruit. And that's, that's the whole idea of trying to find leverage um, is... You know, if yeah, but it's but it's a bit of a it's a bit of a guessing game. I don't, I you know, it could just be that that it's an incompetent group that's working on it, and so it's it's hard to know. All right, well, let's let's before let's give him a round of applause, Sean, for an awesome talk. Thank you. Thank you. And a new cold beer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's do Q and A. Just raise your hand. Like I said, Perry and I are running the mics. Here you go. Uh, awesome talk, Sean. Thanks. What is the best way of choosing a metric, especially when you're creating a platform, and if you only go by the number of users who sign up, instead of how well it is creating the value for them. Uh, so the reason why I'm asking is sometimes it all depends on how well the user is leveraging your platform. Yeah. If they don't use it properly, then obviously the metric would not be correct. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's a great question. So my way of, of doing that is I ignore all feedback from people who don't give me the indication that it's a must have for them. So I am, my filter, uh, I, I basically, unless they say it's a must have, like I, I don't care what they say the core value is. So, and, and the way I identify that is I ask them how they would feel if they could no longer use the product. And I'm looking only at people who say they'd be very disappointed if they couldn't use it anymore. And then I have a process that basically starts open-ended so open-ended feedback from one group of people. We'll try to figure out what are the top three or four kind of distinct reasons that, that they consider it a must-have. And then the next group of people, I'm actually giving them a choice, A, B, C, or D, on those reasons. And I'm looking at people who pick A, drilling in and saying, man, 70% of the people who picked benefit A or you know, the user experience A that, that they're getting out of the product, are saying they'd be very disappointed without it. And then the, you know, but another group, maybe it's 25%, but like a large group of people are picking that one. So then there's a little bit of strategy where you have to pick, pick do I want maybe a little bit niche audience that's hardcore passionate, or do I want a bit broader that's, that's you know, for me, like it, it has to get above a threshold. And for me, the threshold's 40%. I need to see within any, with any segment, it's got to be above 40% of the people saying they'd be very disappointed without the product for me to feel like there's enough signal to kind of work that. But it's sort of a, a quick shortcut to at least figure out, that's how I figure out what the core value is. And then once I understand the core value, I'm trying to figure out what is a way to quantify that in a single metric. And that then becomes my Northstar metric. Yeah. Um, hi. Quick question. Oh, sorry, you got one there. So um, you, you mentioned a, a lot of companies now um, have a separate growth team. Um, 
a product development team that's, um, that really has empowerment to focus on their North Star metrics and uh, really execute on that. And um, what I've seen sometimes is that that group can sometimes be um, not fully aligned with, let's say, the core product development team. And uh -huh. I was wondering if you had any comments around um, you know, what, what are important things to consider when um, trying to set up a separate kind of growth team yeah. versus having like a growth mindset within a product development team and what are the, what are the challenges, what are the benefits of, of each uh, kind of scenario and what are the things we should look out for? Yeah, so I agree that there, there's often a tension between core product and a growth team and I think one way to solve against that is to actually have the product or the growth team sit within the product organization. That's, you, you see that usually the, kind of the bigger the company is and the later that they're introducing a growth team, that often works the best to kind of deal with that tension. And so you, you are seeing more uh, heads of product become head of product and growth. And they've got basically their growth team and their product team and they can kind of keep, keep balance against that. Um, in, you also have a model where sometimes it's an autonomous growth team that's reporting to the CEO. And, um, and I think it really kind of depends on, on the company itself. But the, uh, you know, as it was explained to me at Uber, before they combined it into a single role of growth and product was that the product team expands potential and the growth team fulfills potential. But um, so, yeah, but, you know, how, how that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the problems that you're talking about are real problems, but probably the solution is going to be a little different in each company. So I don't, don't know beyond that. <laughs> Hi. Um, how often do you run into a situation where uh, you recognize that there's not a role for you in a company because they're uh, too early? Uh, I'm, I'm referencing the chasm. Yeah. And like too early adopter or innovator market versus um, early and late majority market. And how, how do you deal with that situation? Um, or is it really a question of setting the right expectations and uh -huh. achieving them or trying to achieve them? So for me, I'm, I, I think a little bit less in terms of the chasm and more in terms of product market fit. If, if there's not clear indication of product market fit, and that's where I, you know, to me, I found a way to, at least for myself, somebody might argue that that's not product market fit, but for myself, it's like quantifying if I can find a targetable segment where more than 40% of those people are considered a must have and say, essentially say they'd be very disappointed without it, I feel like I can, I can grow that. So if they say they'd be very disappointed without it, they're likely to keep using it. So that's like an early indicator of retention. And, um, and so, but, but interestingly on the chasm question, when I was at Dropbox, I actually asked from the very first month we were public with the product, I asked uh, every single month I repeated this research where I asked which best describes you I like to be among the first to try cool new technology or I only try uh, I only try products that I think will be useful for me and when we when I started that research it was 80% saying that they like to be among the first to try cool new technology and it literally every single month ratcheted it up to where six months later it was reversed, where it was 80%, I only try things that I think will be useful. And I, in, in kind of like watching what happened with word of mouth, that I found that the early adopters, the motivation to try the product is different between an early adopter and a mainstream user. And this is my interpretation, like we could probably argue this for forever, there might be some other people have different uh, view on this. I think that the motivation is, is different to try it, but the, but they quickly become the same on continuing to use it. Yeah. Like you're not, even if you're an early adopter, you're not gonna keep using it if you have no value from it. Especially if you're an early adopter because you're just gonna move on to the next shiny object and you just don't have the capacity to use every single product a lot. And so they're just because they're trying things at a faster pace doesn't mean they keep using them at that faster pace. And so early adopters can then communicate the, the benefit to more mainstream users, and I think that's a lot of what we saw at Dropbox. But, yeah, you know. <laughs> that, that's fascinating, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? 
You had a question? Sean answered all the questions. You're now all growth it's hackers. All out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wanna do another one? <laughs> I think we got one back there as well. I'll go next. Oh. Uh, so I, I don't know if she asked that question because I was thinking about my question. Yeah, my I get mind. it. I do that. But <laughs> basically, um, a lot of these tests sometimes, uh, depending on the company, require agility, right? Uh, ability to put this out there in production very quickly. And maybe a lot of what you're talking about has to do with the corporate website versus the actual product. Uh, but what if it's integrated? What if you have to put it inside a product and the normal time to get that into production uh, in a company is like 45 days? Yeah. And you can't run that test. And do, so how do, you do, how do you hack that growth hacking problem within the company? Yeah, so, so definitely like hardware is going to be going to take a lot longer to, to run tests than say a software product and a web-based product is going to take longer than a, or, or shorter than a software product. And yeah, 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 you know, and, and it, that, that ultimately I think what you should be doing is, is quantifying the number of tests you're running and keeping track of it and trying to improve the throughput of testing over time. Like hold yourself, set, set the bar of where you are. I, I actually met with somebody today from one of the kind of a uh, kind of unicorn early growth team companies and she was explaining that that their their half of the of the growth team there's kind of like two growth teams there and they're they're not running tests at the same pace that they used to like a very a much slower pace and and so I think as you get bigger there is going to be some more bureaucracy around that but if you don't run the test you don't learn and if you're running one test per month you're just, you're just not learning very much, and there's probably a ton of variations that, you know, you, if you go through those variations, you're going to see, you're going to see signal. And so, um, even in my own company, we we're just about done with the rebuild of our product. That's going to make it like five times easier to release new features, and which is, you know, so 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 part of it is investing in testability of the product and then part of it is actually investing in the tests itself and um, yeah. I think did you have a question back there I don't want uh, he's got two more no okay yeah you're good then sorry save them and we'll jump <laughs> oh no, it's good you're doing great <laughs> yep hi um you you manage the you seem like you have a really good process for managing the the tests and the metrics and all that. Do you have any tools that you can recommend that help your company manage those processes? Are there any? Thank you for asking that. <laughs> that's what that's what our product does. Okay. <laughs> so, so, again? Growth Hackers projects. I can't okay. focus. You got to find my book just came out. So. <laughs> uh, but projects.growthhackers.com. So that was projects.growthhackers.com. Cool. Well, why don't we break since we got a little late start with all the AV. Thank you so much yep. for being gracious throughout all the AV tech difficulties. <laughs> Let's give Sean another round of applause. <laughs>